Welcome to the 2024 Just Economy Conference. The program will begin in 10 minutes. Please make your way to an open seat. Our program will begin in five minutes. Please find a seat.
Our content will begin momentarily. Please welcome Phyllis Edwards to the stage. Good afternoon, everybody. Are we going to do this one more time? Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. That's right, that's right. My name is Phyllis Edwards, and I'm proud to serve on the board of the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. And I'm even prouder of the great work we've done together in my hometown of Detroit. <laughs> on behalf of the board, NCRC staff, and around, around 700 members, organizations around the country, I want to welcome you to the 2024 Just Economy Conference here in Washington, D.C. Give yourselves a round of applause. I'm so excited that you're all here with us. As you look around this room and know that you're seeing the past, present, and future of the economic justice movement, Together, we are powerful. Together, we can bring opportunity to the places in this country where it doesn't yet exist. Together, we can help bring dignity to the lives of the millions and millions of Americans who aren't yet getting what they deserve from their country. I'm honored to be a, a member of the Detroit Coalition of NCRC and through NCRC, our member, our member coalition have come together. We're no longer working in silos. We're working together to address the housing issues in Detroit. We have been able to get funding from banks, which we might not otherwise have gotten. And we are working diligently, collaboratively, as a result of our NCRC membership and our NCRC affiliation. Again, all that's been made possible by our membership in NCRC, and I can't endorse it strongly enough. If you don't want to take my word for it, just ask some other members while you're here this week. Look for the folks with the red ribbon on their conference badge. By the way, to my fellow members, this is important. NCRC is listening and wants to hear from you. We need your feedback to help us how we can improve upon the member benefits and continue enhancing our support for your work. And so we need you to complete our member survey. It's a quick five minute survey right there in the conference app. You have the conference app, right? You have the conference app, right? Okay. We've got a packed schedule these next couple of days 
and many of you were up on Capitol Hill yesterday to make our voices heard as part of the NCRC annual Hill Day. How many people were on Hill Day? All right, it does make a difference. So get that lunch in, get refueled, because we're going to cover a lot of ground today. In the breakout rooms at the reception, we'll drill down on what change making looks like on the ground. Here on the main stage, we are going to look at the bigger picture and get insights from some of the people who hold the most power in our issue space here in Washington. And we're going to hear from NCRC leader Jesse Van Toll about what the next, what's next for this movement. Because we are a movement, we're a coalition of people doing hundreds of different types of work in thousands of different places. But we all have one shared goal, to make a just economy a national priority and a local reality. We're going to start our first main stage session in just a couple of minutes, but first I want to share some tools and some tips to make the most of your experience here. And so you can take advantage of all we have to offer. First, don't forget you can use the conference mobile app to view and personalize your conference schedule. Read speaker bios, contact other attendees, and you'll, and you'll need it to complete session evaluations which is very important. Those evaluations really help us, so please don't forget to submit yours after each session that you attend. You are attending the sessions, right? You can find the conference mobile app in iTunes or Google Play App Store. You should have received a QR code that would point you to the app, or just, reach, or just search for C-Vent Events app. That's C as in Charlie Vent, E as in Eric Vent. Two words. Once you're in the app, search for the Just Economy Conference. And again, you, you current NCRC members out there, in the app, you'll see our membership survey. Please, please take a few minutes to let us know how we're doing. Last couple of things for everybody. Don't forget to let the world know that you're here and why. Share your pics and your thoughts on social media, and don't forget to include the hashtag Just Economy. If you have any questions about that or anything else while you're here, look for the NCRC staff, staff member, and they got a white ribbon on their badges, and we'll be happy to help you. And make sure you check out the Just Economy Pavilion just outside the doors to the ballroom here. Our organization, organizing and marketing teams want to hear from you at the NCRC advocacy table and the Just Economy Pledge Table. Our research and our policy teams have some pretty cool displays and interactive learning situations, and the NCRC store is here too. So if you are looking to take some merchandise home, please stop by the store. I want to thank all of you conference sponsors, and especially our platinum, diamond, and gem level sponsor, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, U.S. Bank, First Horizon Bank, PNC Bank, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo, Citibank, Bank of America, and finally but not least, Flagstar Bank. I also want to thank a special thanks you to all the workers in this hotel who make this event possible. And I do hope you're treating them with dignity and respect. They make this event possible. So Local 25 and Local 99. I used to be a member of UAW Local 6000 in Michigan, and I worked very diligently with Local 600. So I've always got a shout out to the union crews. So let's hear one more time for these hardworking folks. And we can do better than that. All right, thank you. We're going to get it rolling right here, right now. It's been a wild year in the banking business sector, and some of the turmoil has had a direct impact on the work that we all do in our communities. And our next featured conversation on the Just Economy main stage is going to help us understand how 
the roller coaster of a year affected us and our work. Please welcome the Vice Chair of, for Supervision at the Federal Reserve, Mr. Michael Barr, and Politico's Victoria Guida. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thanks very Have much. Thank you. Wow, what a great audience. Yeah, hello. Yeah. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, welcome to the Vice Chairman. I'm excited to be here. It's going to be a great conversation. Um, I'll, I'll jump right in with, uh, you know, the, the latest news is that on Friday, uh, the Community Reinvestment Act rules were uh, blocked, temporarily blocked by a judge, which I'm sure all of you know. Um, and I, I know you're not going to want to comment on the lawsuit directly, but I was just kind of wondering from your perspective if you could lay in the groundwork of why, you know, from, from the purpose of the law, why these rules were necessary, why they're, they're, they're better. Well, as, as you suggested, I'm not going to comment on the lawsuit, but uh, I do think it's really important to understand how important the Community Re Reinvestment Act is and can be for communities all over the country. All the organizations in this room know that. You've been working on it firsthand for many, many decades. I see John Taylor over here. You know, you all, you all have been working in this space for so many, many decades. You know how important it is to have good bank partners in the work you have in your communities. And one of the reasons that you can have good bank partners in your communities is with a strong Community Reinvestment Act. And so what we've done under the Community Reinvestment Act rules is really update CRA for the communities that you live in today. What does that mean? It means providing greater clarity and transparency so both communities and banks can know what the expectations is. It means updating the rules so that you know what community development activities count uh, for CRA consideration. It means making sure that banks are serving their entire communities, whether those communities are near their bank branches or in other parts of the country where they're doing lending uh, and investing. So that kind of approach, I think, really uh, has the opportunity to make the CRA vibrant for the next 25, 30 years. Well, and I should also ask, I mean, you know, there's obviously an underlying statute here. Do you think it would be helpful for Congress to, to modernize the law? Well, I, I think we have a, one of the things that I think that is a really positive about the way Congress wrote this law, they wrote it in 1977 in a, in a broad way, and they left it to the banking agencies to make sure that CRA kept working over time. And so uh, CRA was put in place in 1977 as part of a, a series of laws, uh, the, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, the Fair Housing Act, and CRA that were really designed together to make our financial system work better for communities, to serve communities, to serve their entire communities in a better way. And it was written in such a way that it permits the bank agencies to get together periodically, as we did in 1995 and now uh, uh, almost three decades later uh, in the 2023 rule, to make sure that it keeps pace with the modern world we live in. So it sounds like no, not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> Um, since we have a lot of uh, CRA enthusiasts, I want to dig in a little bit on the details. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the new metrics in the rule, but I know there's also some qualitative factors. So I'm just wondering, you know, um, particularly relevant to this audience, you know, is, what is the difference in terms of what the community group input means in the CRA process from the old process and mm -hmm. to the new? Well, I think the community group input is one of the constants uh, over time. So. Uh, the new rule improves our metrics, our quantitative metrics, our comparability, transparency across the system, I think, in a positive way. It raises the bar so that we see more bank lending. Uh, I think there's lots of room to see better bank lending in this space. I'll get to in just a second. But 
uh, one of the constants is that it's really critical for examiners and for banks to know how they're doing from the community groups and civil rights organizations and affordable housing providers and small business lenders on the ground in communities that set the performance context for the evaluation that bank examiners need to do because community organizations know better than anybody what the needs of the community are, what the gaps in lending or investing in the community are, how good is the local uh, bank or the national bank, the, the bank serving this, these communities, how well are they doing? That community group input is absolutely essential for making good qualitative judgments about the performance of a bank under CRA. And in, in trying to answer those questions, what kind of feedback specifically is most useful? Well, I think, you know, as much detail as is possible on the kinds of things I just said. So, you know, what are the gaps in lending? What are the gaps in investing? What are the gaps in services? How well are low and moderate income people currently being served? What are the innovative products that are needed in the local community that could make a difference? What are the deals that are harder to structure in that community and therefore should get more credit, should be seen as having you know, a greater impact in that community. And, and then, you know, look from a forward-looking perspective and then from a backward-looking perspective, what's your experience been in working with banks serving this community? Are they responsive to community needs? Are they being creative in the products and services they offer? Are they, you know, at the basic level, meeting the financial services needs of the communities? And banks are also weighted on you know, different geographic locations, um, and then also at the overall institution level. So how does that, how does that work? How, how does the, the geographic location specifically relate to the overall grade? Well, so one of the things that this rule does is it updates the Community Reinvestment Act in important ways by including for assessment for certain banks that do activity outside of their branch network, making sure that those communities also are brought into the evaluation. So if you have a bank that's doing lots of lending outside of its branch network, or if it's an online bank and it doesn't have any branch network, you want to know how well it's serving low and moderate income people in all the communities where it is doing business. And so the rule takes that into account. The rule also includes a clarity to let uh, banks know and communities know that community development financing activity can be measured in communities all across the country. So one of the things that that does is, let's say uh, you have some parts of the country where there's lots of bank community development activity, and there's almost sort of too much competing for those deals, and then you have other parts of the country where there's no community development activity at all, or very little. You know, for example, a lot of Native American communities, native lands, don't have enough banks with branches on them, and they historically have gotten very little community development financing. This rule would now give credit for a bank, let's say you have a bank that wants to serve a native community, doesn't happen to have a branch there, they can get credit for providing community development finance to that Native American community as an example. So that's an important update to the rule. And then to your question, how do they, these things add up? Well, they get weighted. So if you have a bank that is mostly based in, say, the western part of Michigan, but does some lending in the eastern part of Michigan, those two things get weighted by the extent of their activity. So sometimes banks wonder, like, if I do a little bit over here, am I going to have to totally change my business in order to comply with CRA? The answer is no. If you do a lot of activity in one place, make sure that your low and moderate income lending and investing in that is commensurate with your engagement. And if you do a little bit of activity in another community, make sure that your low and moderate income activity is commensurate with your engagement there. And those get weighted. So the, the activities that you're doing more of count more than the areas where you're doing less. And that kind of weighting means that CRA is really flexible and open to the business practices and models of the banks that are being assessed. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, another thing that I think banks uh, 
are particularly focused on is, is uh, bank mergers and CRA is um, you know, a component of that. So I did want to ask, you know, to what extent do you, when you're looking at mergers generally, to what extent do you want to see an affirmative benefit to the community as part of why the merger should go through? Yeah, you know, we have, um, under the Bank Merger Act, we have four categories of things in a big picture way that we look at. We, we look at the effects on competition. We look at financial and managerial capacity to effectuate the merger. We look at financial stability, and we look at convenience and needs. And convenience and needs is a broad category that includes how well has the bank served its community. An important way to measure that is by their rating under the Community Reinvestment Act. So we want to see strong past performance. And then banks also submit information about their plans going forward. Are they going to close a bunch of branches in low-income communities or open more? Are they planning to serve uh, low-income communities better in the future or not? Uh, what kinds of products and services do they intend to keep or to grow in the merged institution? So we take all of that into account in thinking about the convenience and needs of the community. Are you all going to be putting something out along the lines of what the FDIC and the OCC have done on this? We're, we're not currently planning to do that. We have, I think, a, a pretty robust process um, that, that follows our existing guidelines um, in this area. We are working with the other bank agencies and the Justice Department to see whether those should be updated. Uh, but that's work that we're thinking about on an interagency basis rather than just us doing something. Got it. And um, you know, another another thing that I have to ask you about is Basel III Endgame. Uh, you know, would raise capital requirements on the big banks. You've talked about, and Chair Powell has talked about that you expect to see broad material changes. Um, you know, it seems like it's an open question whether or not you're going to issue a reproposal. So, is I guess my first question is: is is there a timeline by which you would like to make that decision as to whether there's going to be a reproposal? We're going to we're going to take a very thoughtful approach to the rule as we've taken all along. You know, we gave uh, the public uh, extra time to comment on the rule because it was a big, complex rule. We're analyzing those comments now. Many of the comments there's there's kind of external chatter about the rule, which I think is not very helpful. And then there's the actual comment process itself where we're getting good substantive comments. I think we'll uh, you know, be evaluating those. We want to make sure that we get the final rule right. Uh, we, we take comments seriously in all our work. Uh, you know, People say, well, do you really look at comments? The answer is, yeah, we really look at comments. We really take them seriously. We got comments a few years ago on the stress test, for example, that uh, we were not properly looking at the risks associated with low-income housing tax credit properties, and we were able to adjust the stress test to take that into account. We got comments more recently um, uh, from the SBA that we were not appropriately thinking about the kinds of um, risk profile of SBIC, small business investment company projects. We were able to update for this year in the stress test our approach to SBICs so that we are appropriately thinking about the risk profile of SBICs differently from other private equity investments. We had a similar issue with the New Markets Tax Credit. People said, you need to think differently about the New Markets Tax Credit uh, for purposes of the Public Welfare Investment Test, which has capital limitations in it, and we were able to adjust for that. So we take all the comments we get on these kinds of issues very seriously. We're taking these very seriously. I expect we'll make adjustments to the final rule. I think it'll be a good, strong uh, rule when it's done, but we're going we're gonna to make changes along the way. Well, this process has been many years coming. It was uh, years of negotiations before it was finished in 2017, and then you know it took a while for the agencies to come to a rule. So were you expecting this, uh, I mean, because given the com complexity of the rule, all the things that it deals with, were you expecting this to be, uh, you know, maybe take some extra work after the proposal came out? Yes, I would say, you know, we, we expected that the proposal would, um, as proposals do, offer the opportunity for public comment. We expected to get a lot of comment uh, on the rule. We expected to make adjustments to the rule, and I, I do think that we will be doing that. All right, and then um, 
Also, a slightly different Basel question. Mm -hmm. um, there was a reporting this morning that um, the, the Fed has been sort of resisting requirements for lenders at the Basel Committee uh, to, to disclose their, their green commitments, how they're trying to follow their green commitments. And I was just wondering, uh, you know, if, if you think that that's the type of international standard that we should or shouldn't have. Well, we have at the Federal Reserve, we, you know, our job is financial stability. Our job is, uh, is the safety and soundness of banks when we think about regulation. And so we do have a role to play on climate. Um, we need to make sure that banks are looking at climate change, assessing their risk, measuring their risk, and preparing for risks associated with climate change. So we've been doing that in a couple ways. We did that by issuing guidance uh, to the largest banks, banks over 100 billion in size, to make sure that they are measuring and managing risk from climate change. And this last year, just for the, large, the very largest banks, the GSIBs, for six of those banks, we engaged in a climate scenario analysis to assess whether they were thinking methodically through these risk measurement and management issues. So we're, we are focused on it, but we're doing that within our mandate. It's an important mandate, but it's a narrow mandate. We're not making climate policy at the Federal Reserve. We're just making sure that uh, institutions we supervise are looking at all their material risks, including the risks from climate change. Is there more to come on that scenario analysis? We, we do. We, we'll have a, a report um, out of the uh, analytics that we did from that, and then uh, we'll have further work that you know I expect we'll do over the coming years. Again, uh, kind of day in and day out work, not flashy work, and certainly not climate policy work. Work that is really focused on the way in which climate change might pose financial risk to banks. Great. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll turn back to, to CRA, um, back to your regularly scheduled programming. Um, I, you know, one of the things that is, is sort of interesting about the, the new rules is there's a focus on, uh, you know, treating deposit products mm -hmm. positively, not just credit products. Can you talk about, you know, why you all decided to do that? Yeah, this, this is an important area. So under the rule, deposit products are treated positively for consideration uh, under, under the rule because deposit products are so essential for low and moderate income households and, and businesses to get access to credit. That's always been the case. We've, we've always looked over at, at the range of financial services that banks provide to low and moderate income households because they're all related to each other. I've been studying CRA and, and financial access issues for more than a quarter of a century. And I can tell you, deposit products are absolutely essential to be on the pathway to financial inclusion. Yeah, and then there's, there, you know, there's, the, there's the community development piece as well. Um, and I know you all are, are sort of monitoring to see um, the extent to which those community development investments are, are increasing or decreasing. So if, you know, what is sort of the analysis that you're doing across banks to look at community development investments? Are you looking at, you know, are you looking at this at the state level? Um, and is, what's sort of the, the, the stick or the carrot? Like if, if investments go down, do the agencies take some sort of action? Well, you know, I, I think, I anticipate that under the revised rule, under the final rule, that we'll see commutative investments go up uh, around the country. We're certainly going to be monitoring that. The, the rule takes special account of those investments. They're given kind of a higher impact factor if you're doing, a, say, a new markets tax credit deal or a low-income low housing tax credit deal that has a higher impact. Qualitatively, as we were talking about before, examiners, we're going to hear from community groups is this the kind of investment or transaction that should be given higher weight because it's a hard deal to do? Those kinds of impact factors for community development investment, I think we'll see investment rising. We're certainly going to be monitoring all aspects of the rule after it's implemented. We've got two years, basically, from uh, the announcement of the rule to implementation. We're going to be taking those two years. The rule starts January 1st, 2026 
to work with community organizations, civil rights groups, banks, examiners all together to make sure implementation is strong going forward. There's also been um, some criticism from the rule. Um, Better Markets put out a report a while back about how, uh, you know, the fact that you look at banks' performance in relation to each other, and so if everybody's performance goes down, that doesn't necessarily ding them. Is there something in place to try and combat that? We, we do look at, at all kinds of metrics. We look at metrics related to how banks perform in relation to each other, and we look at how banks perform in relation to the low and moderate income communities they serve. Right now, there's a lot of room for improvement, I, I would say. So, you know, if you just look at, for example, large banks, banks over 100 billion in size, they account for about 9% by volume of mortgage lending to low and moderate income communities. They account for about 16% overall of mortgage lending to all communities. So why are the largest banks only doing 9% by volume of their lending to low and moderate income communities? That, that seems quite low. If you compare that to smaller banks, banks under 100 billion, they're doing about proportional to their mortgage lending size. So they provide about 22 or 23% of originations overall for mortgage lending. And they provide about 22% of lending to low and moderate income communities. So there's, for the big banks, there's a lot of room for improvement and we're gonna be looking for that under the new CRA rules. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I, before we run out of time, I do wanna ask you, since you are the vice chair for supervision, uh, the banking sector generally, uh, you know, we obviously had, a, whatever you want to call it, banking crisis, banking situation last year. Um, how are the banks doing? Um, what, are the, what are the big risks that you're watching right now? Well, I would say overall the banking system is, is sound and resilient. We're not seeing the kind of liquidity pressures uh, that we saw you know, a year ago in March of 2023. There are pockets of risk in the system. We do have banks that are uh, more under stress than other banks. Um, we're, we're looking at things like what's the level of unrealized losses on the balance sheet from, uh, from securities. We're looking at banks that have particular kinds of concentration uh, in commercial real estate. So for example, a commercial real estate covers lots and lots of different sectors. The office commercial real estate sector is under stress more than other parts of the sector and there's heterogeneity around the country. So we're just looking very carefully at banks that have heavy concentrations in office commercial real estate where there are significant expected price declines is another example. We're, we're always worried about and think all the time about operational risk exposure. So, you know, banks exposure to cybersecurity risk is a, a big operational risk and one that is a a constant kind of threat to the system that we have to be uh, careful and monitor. So those are examples of some of the kinds of things on our minds now. On the, on the commercial real estate piece of it, is there like a, a time period when, you know, once we've gotten through X mm -hmm. year, we'll know we've made it through? Like, how are you yeah. thinking about that? This is, this is the kind of thing where it's likely to be a very slow moving train as uh, the financial sector and commercial real estate market move forward. Why is that? Well, um, commercial real estate properties uh, refinance at a periodic cycle. Those are not all done on, in one year or one month. Those are being refinanced slowly over time. So over the next two to three years, we're gonna see how uh, properties deal with that refinancing in a in a higher interest rate environment than the extremely low interest rate environment they were operating in um, pre-2019. Uh, some of those deals will keep penciling out just fine. Others of them will be worked out uh, in ways that are not problematic for the, for the banks that, that funded them because they have high levels of equity cushions. And other banks are gonna see losses on those loans. So that will take some time to work through. And we're obviously operating in an environment in which for office uh, commercial real estate, 
uh, in general, this is a generalization, uh, vacancy rates have increased or occupancy rates have lowered because of work from home. And so for some categories of office CRE, that means they're more exposed to risk. Yeah, so you, you can't say for certain when we're through it. <laughs> It'll take some time, <laughs> as we say in Fedland. <laughs> Soon. Soon. Um, <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, Vice Chairman, and thank you so much to all of you. This has been um, a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate you for taking the time. Thanks, Victoria, and thanks to all of you. And Great thanks audience. to NCRC. Thank you so much. Let's give Vice Chair Barr and Politico's Victoria Guida another round of applause. It's always so interesting to hear from folks within our government who work so hard to make good policy and clear, fair, and sound decisions in key moments. And everyone knows we're in key moments right now. Vice Chair Barr and his colleagues have a big responsibility to will well the power that we've entrusted them with to protect the financial stability of our country, to ensure that our financial systems work for us, and we at NCRC are grateful to have such a faithful public servant stewarding our privilege and our responsibility. But let me pause on that for a moment. When we say that government agencies have power what we really mean, or I really mean, including in this, is that they have the ability to act in order to achieve the purpose for which they were formed. And in a democracy, as civil rights activist Ben Jealous says, there are only two types of power. There are organized people and organized money. And organized money only, have, only wins when people aren't organized. So it's important that we stay organized and get other organized with us. And that, my friend, is even more true when we're talking about the powers needed to make sure that our financial system work for our communities. Sometimes lots of time, well, sometimes lots of time, that means we have to fight. There are bad actors out there who want to take advantage of the people and places we represent. So we stand up for the communities and we fight back. 2024 is going to be a big year for those fights. Got your gloves on? Got your shoes on? We're going to get a little dirty. <laughs> Last year, we got two huge wins from our government, the new Community Reinvestment Act regulations and the new Section 1071, Small Business Lending Rules. But the big banks turned around and filed a lawsuit to try to block them, both. And on top of that, now we have one of the biggest banks on the planet and the single largest subprime credit card lender in America seeking permission to buy up one of its rivals and gain even more power to target the people we all serve. We're battling on multiple fronts at the same time. But luckily, we have a strong coalition and a great leadership in that fight. Great partnerships as we fight together right here in this room. So please welcome the man who is on top and out front and leading us at the NCRC, our own NCRC president and CEO, Mr. Jesse Van Toll. Big round of applause. So good and they all yours. Thank you, Tullis. Good afternoon. So many of you. It's a full room. It's great to be here. Um, and it's great to have uh, the Vice Chair Michael Barr, a great ally and a great friend of NCRC speaking to us here today. I want to tell you uh, three quick stories uh, about persistence, uh, which is one of NCRC's core values. Uh, 
Um, and you'll see why in a moment why persistence is so important to us. When I was 18 years old, I almost died. I was canoe camping with friends, high school friends, in the Boundary Waters, uh, the space between the United States and Canada, in the backwoods. And I went for a little walk away from camp, alone. I crossed the peninsula we were on to the other side of the lake. And on the way back, I foolishly took a different route. I got turned around. I got confused. After almost an hour of walking, I knew that I was lost. Unbeknownst to me, I had walked the one way that I couldn't walk, the exact wrong way. I had walked out the one side of the peninsula that had land. I was exhausted, disoriented, discombobulated. At one point, I got stuck in a bog. I was becoming dehydrated. I drank dirty swamp water. And that's when it hit me. My blood sugar was dropping dangerously low. You see, I'm a type 1 diabetic, what used to be called a juvenile uh, diabetes. That's an autoimmune disease. Type 1 diabetics, uh, their body destroys their ability to produce and regulate insulin. And exercise makes you use the insulin that you've injected more efficiently. And that sends your blood sugar downwards. Low blood sugar causes weakness, confusion, and the shakes. Get low enough and your body shuts down. No sugar left to burn, no energy for essential functions. At this point, panic set in. I had no food. The realization that I was going to die in these woods crept over me. I fell to my knees, weak. My head was in a fog. I cried. I prayed. I pleaded, really, for my life. I grew despondent. I knew in this moment that I was done, that this was it. When they say that your life flashes before your eyes, it's really true. I had faint images of my life experiences and a powerful sense of emotion, a torrent of feelings. I saw my mother, my father, my brothers, my sister, my friends. Not just the moments that we had shared together, but a sense of loss for the future that wouldn't be coming. At that point, I stood up. I had to live. To do otherwise would leave a hole for family and friends. The promise of a young life wiped out. I mustered every ounce of strength that I had. I climbed a tree. I spied a path. I found my way, and I walked out of those woods that day. I persisted because I had something that was worth fighting for. There's a second story about persistence. In 2016, I stood up on this stage, along with John Taylor, our founder, who's here today, and with many of you, and we announced a groundbreaking community benefits agreement with KeyBank to serve underserved communities. Five years after that agreement, we became concerned about their efforts to fulfill the agreement. It became apparent that their lending had gotten worse, not better. We raised concerns about KeyBank's lending in minority and underserved communities and whether it had kept its promise to be a leader in inclusive home mortgage lending. NCRC published several reports on key banks lending with special concerns raised in certain metropolitan areas, including Philadelphia, New York, Hartford, Bridgeport, and New Haven. 
the very footprint that they acquired when they bought First Niagara and announced that community benefits agreement. Now, it would have been easy for us to walk away. We could have pretended that the CBA had done everything that it was supposed to do. We could have avoided the critique of our own methods. Or we could lean in. And we chose to lean in. We chose to persist because we had something worth fighting for, a better bank and a better community, the opportunity for thousands of people of color to build wealth. We persisted, and persistence pays off. So I stand before you today to make an announcement right here at the conference, an agreement to resolve our concerns with KeyBank. And now this is a big deal. Today, NCRC and KeyBank are announcing a $25 million agreement to work together to ensure greater levels of investment in minority and underserved communities. As million, it's million, I'll, I'll get to the billions. As, as, as part of this agreement, KeyBank will provide $17 million in subsidies to fund grants, down payment assistance, fee waivers, product and branch expansion, and marketing designed to expand credit and assist loan applicants in minority and underserved communities. KeyBank and NCRC will be independently responsible for allocating $8.5 million each, each with meaningful input from the other. KeyBank will provide $8 million to support NCRC's mission to build a just economy. <laughs> KeyBank and NCRC will collaborate on an ongoing basis to continue to improve KeyBank's lending to minority and underserved communities. And most important of all, we will return to the table to work in good faith to form a new community benefits agreement with KeyBank with the potential to channel billions of dollars of lending capital into communities. Good friends tell their friends when they've gotten off track. And NCRC is a good friend. <laughs> we will always remain open to partnership and collaboration to those who are truly committed to improving, to those who share our goals, our values, and our vision for a just economy. With KeyBank, we persisted. We had something worth fighting for. Third story. We turn to the present moment, a new challenge. It's an opportunity to show the financial industry that they cannot undermine economic justice for profit, not without a fight. You have, may have heard that Capital One has proposed to buy Discover. This is a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad idea. I should just end the speech there. Let me say that again. <laughs> this is a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad idea. And not just because it would create another too big to fail bank, and not just because it would undermine competition and raise prices for consumers. It's also a bad idea because Capital One is a bad actor. Notorious might be a better word. Because anybody who's been paying attention to how Capital One moves for the past couple of decades, knows this is not a company our communities can rely on. We saw that when Capital One bought ING Direct a decade ago. They made a $180 billion 10-year commitment that wasn't worth the paper it was printed on. It was a commitment to do more of the same, mostly subprime credit card and auto lending. The one part of the commitment that was good, a commitment to mortgage lending, turned out to be a false promise as Capital One abandoned the mortgage 
business just a few years later. NCRC led the charge then, galvanized opposition to their merger, generating dozens of negative news stories, hundreds of comments, and protests of their merger at every turn. That's right, you can clap for that. We didn't win back then, not entirely. Their merger got improved. But we have persisted because that's what we do. Capital One has not changed for the better. Our concerns today were the same as our concerns 10 years ago. Their business model is built around luring low and moderate income people into debt that they'll struggle to pay off. Half of Capital One's profits come from fees and interest, which means it comes at the direct expense of people who have been unable to repay what they have borrowed. And Capital One doesn't luck into those revenue streams. It seeks them out. It hunts for them in the same streets and neighborhoods where we all try to do good work every day. In the financial press, Capital One is hailed as a leader and an innovator. You know why? Because they've led the charge to use big data to precisely identify the sorts of striving families who could really use a credit limit increase. They identify those people with numbers and computers, and then they chase after them until they sign them up for a credit card with high interest rates and stringent fee structures. And that's all bad enough on its own. But even worse, Capital One's been identified as one of the banks behind the lawsuits to gut the new CRA rule, joining hands with the American Bankers Association and the Chamber of Commerce. Once again, NCRC has led the opposition. We immediately detailed to the regulators all the reasons this anti-competitive merger cannot be allowed. We came together with strong national partners to demand public hearings on the merger and other key accountability processes. This opposition led to coverage in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Associated Press, Reuters, Bloomberg, Politico, and many others. And we're marshalling you, our members, to make your own voices heard in the public comment process. And we are educating lawmakers about what they can do to ensure that the same markets that have been made so often, sorry, the same mistakes that have been made so often with other mega mergers do not get made in this case. Other huge deals that made rich executives and shareholders richer at the expense of communities you and I fight for. We've been in these types of battles before. And too often, the government failed to heed the warnings of community groups. Too often, the pressure on our government to say yes to big business has left them saying oops many years later to the rest of us when it blows up in their face. So now we have to fight that type of fight again. And this time, this time, we can win. Because during that 10 years since Capital One was approved to buy ING Direct, we didn't just sit idly by, we were persistent. We worked to change merger policy. We worked to reinvigorate the public interest standards in banking law. We promoted community benefits agreements, now totaling over half a trillion dollars. And we have enforced them, insisted they be made real, as our effort with key bank shows. Because of our persistence, Capital One's deal is on the ropes. And we will continue to fight because we have something worth fighting for. A banking regulatory system that says no to bad actors, one that recognizes the difference between a legitimate community commitment and a cynical one made just to get merger approval and then torn up afterwards. As we look to the future, it is easy to be pessimistic. 
Our enemies conspire against us. People we believed to be friends may fail us. CRA is under attack. 1071 is under attack. Just four years after George Floyd, DEI and racial equity are under attack. Our people are under attack. One of our presidential candidates has even warned of a bloodbath if he doesn't win. And I, for one, believe him. We're going to fight for our lives, fight for our nation, a fight for a future worth fighting for. And some days it may feel as though we're lost in the woods, headed in the wrong direction. Some days it may feel as though we've lost all energy to go on. And that's how life can feel for a nonprofit leader, for an advocate, for a change maker, for many of us. Like rolling a rock up a hill, like an endless walk in the woods, like we might not get to the mountaintop. Not now or not ever. But remember, it doesn't matter how many times we get knocked down. It's only how many times we get back up that matters. And remember, we have something that's worth fighting for. I want to close here today with a message to the American Bankers Association, to the Chamber of Commerce, to Capital One, to any bank that thinks it can pretend to be about racial equity and then not be about racial equity, to anybody who would turn their backs on serving the community. We represent the community. You mess with us, Let's try that again. Mess with us. Mess with us. Now, to some people, that probably sounds like a threat. It's not a threat. It's a warning. Be careful of us. On that, we must insist. And we will persist, and we will continue. We will stand up and walk out of these woods because we have something that's worth fighting for. Say it with me. We have something worth fighting for. Thank you. Thank you for attending today's lunch plenary session. Please make your way to your breakout rooms. Our next round of sessions begins at 2.15.